Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. I have already time warped 100 days to see how things would shape up and this is our test stay for our four Kerbals here. And uh, well, the food, water, oxygen, nitrogen, lithium hydroxide all seem to have diminished by 100 days except the oxygen has replenished. We started off with only 2 years and 253 days. Now we have 5 years and 300 days and increasing and that's because of the liquid oxygen boil off. Um, it seems to be boiling off a lot faster here than I thought it would though. And uh, the numbers here look all right. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's boiling off a crazy amount here, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, he, uh, on the Kerbalism display, it's going really fast. So yeah, we've got lots of oxygen. Maybe we might want to actually not carry that much oxygen considering the boil off. But the water is a problem because 100 days um, got taken out, but we're supposed to have water recyclers. And really, we do have a lot of water. You can see here 3,000 units of water right now. And um, I don't know what the rate is here because, uh, I don't know, sometimes when I hover over things, a rate is given and other times uh, nitrogen seems to be given, oxygen seems to be given, water doesn't, and food doesn't battery is fluctuating. So yeah, uh, we've got two recyclers that don't seem to be doing their job. Let me uh, deselect food here. And uh, they are placed on this module here. There's one here. Actually, technically there's two there because that's the only module in that external ECLSS module. And then there's another here. I don't know, uh, show upgraded stats. Well, I don't know about upgraded stats, but yeah, it's just not recycling the water. Um, if there was recycling the water, we wouldn't have 1,740 waste water right now. Um, maybe it's because the waste is topped off? I don't know. That's a theory. But I'm going to have to figure out exactly why it's having this problem, or we're going to have a lot of trouble getting to Mars, because water is heavy. Water is really heavy. Water is the heaviest life support component. So we need to make sure we're recycling that. Anyway, uh, other than that, we have a little bit of a problem as far as stress and radiation. 100 days is one-tenth of the full Mars mission. And right now we have 5% stress and 7% radiation uh, with some variation. Um, Valentina seems to have less radiation and more stress. Not too sure why that would be. I, I recall women being somewhat more susceptible to radiation. Their radiation limit is lower because they have different kinds of cancer. Um, so seems like it should be the other way around. Should be less stress and more radiation maybe. But uh, anyway, um, we'll have to see about how those numbers... I doubt it's based on gender, but we only have one sample here. Uh, so times 10, that means 50% stress and 70% radiation. That seems like a lot. So, yeah, we'll have to think about that. It's still possible, but they tend to get crazy even when they're approaching 50% stress. Now, we do have remote control capability on this vessel, but they might start breaking things. So, yeah, there were a couple of comments I wanted to broach. First of all, yes, the IVA view is messed up. Um, I apparently place the Kerbals incorrectly in here. Um, they may, they, they probably should go a long ways. There's a lot of space in here because 3.6 meter diameter interior here and the Kerbals are only one meter a piece. So how this whole business got, how, how that happened, I have no idea. I don't think I would have put them like that. But anyway, Jeb is all right. Other than that, um, somebody mentioned, well, this can only carry one liner. Uh, the, Goal of this is just to provide habitat space for Kerbals on the journey to Mars and on the journey back from Mars, maybe around Mars for some time. Um, its goal is not to carry a huge amount of other payload except for the habitat area. It does carry the lander, but that's not really our only Mars payload. So the comment was, doesn't seem like much colonizing is going to get done. Plenty of colonizing can get done. We're going to be launching other things to Mars when we get to the window. So this is not the only thing that's going to go to Mars. 
on that transfer window in uh, between 131 and 144 days. We'll launch out of rockets with other payloads. And frankly, uh, considering it takes like 4,000 meters per second to get up to this thing or more, um, that means any rocket with a payload that can get that payload to this uh, Mars transfer vehicle can also send it to Mars because that's about the same amount that it takes to get to Mars. So yeah, uh, just getting it over to Mars directly is just as good as, as getting it to this transfer vehicle. Um, and that would generally be the case for like a cycler or, or anything like that. So yeah, it would generally be true. The only reason we want to attach anything to this Mars transfer vehicle right now is for it to be available for the Kerbals, right? I mean, if we eventually send Kerbals, they might want the lander there so that they know that they have that part of the mission uh, right there with them instead of having to run, do a Mars orbit rendezvous with the lander. The Mars orbit rendezvous with the lander is something I've thought about, but uh, it would be somewhat less mm, solid, if you will. So yeah, that's the idea. There are the other payloads we have to send are, we need to send a scanner, right? At least one, uh, probably three if we want to put permanent scanners around Phobos and Deimos. We need to send an ISRU unit or probably multiple ISRU units, tests, test units for Mars after we do the scanning. Um, obviously we'll have a lander on here and uh, that's probably what we're going to try and launch next because I'm not 100% sure that a Sujita Super Heavy can launch it fully fueled up to here. Now, it doesn't need it to need to launch it fully fueled up to here because we can replenish its fuel using the supplies here, but we'll see. And uh, yeah, so maybe a station module, maybe other probes for Phobos and Deimos. There's a whole bunch of business that we can send once we get to the Mars transfer window. Also, while this is on its way to Mars and all the other stuff is on its way to Mars, we'll be constructing more of these in orbit around Earth because the next window is going to happen in like 730 days, 780 days, somewhere between those. And that means that the next Mars window happens before this transfer vehicle gets back. So we'll build another one of these so that it can be on its way before this one gets back. And hopefully we'll learn stuff about this one and build the next one a little bit better. I'll try and expedite that and not take too many videos building that, of course, now that you've got the picture as far as how this was constructed. So yeah, anyway, let's launch something to this. Let's launch that lander. And then we'll probably bring the Kerbals back and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. Okay, so here we go, launching our lander to our Mars transfer vehicle, and we'll see how that goes. I'll just uh, go with it manually here, and this is a Sujita Super Heavy. So, ignition. And these are not in the right place. There we go. All right. So... The water recycler situation is a bit complicated. I could make my own water re recycler, but uh, presumably the Kerbalism one should work. There are two possibilities for why it isn't. A, there's not enough space for waste. Or uh, B, it has to be actually on the module that has the water <laughs> or the wastewater. And so because it's not on a module with wastewater, that's the problem. Um, our current crew on board the Mars transfer vehicle does not have tools, so we could send another crew up briefly with tools, uh, or at least an engineer, uh, to uh, take the water recyclers off the Quest airlock and move them to the places where wastewater is going to occur. So maybe that'll help. Though, you know, I would think that it should be a system-wide sort of thing. Now, if we take a look here, uh, this is 220 water for four Kerbals for two weeks, 14 days. So the 3,000 water that we have on board um, is definitely for, you know, hundreds of days. Well, currently 200 days, it said on there. And th so it wasn't counting the recycling, and the recycling wasn't happening. I'm pretty confident about that. So it wasn't just that we didn't have much water. So we'll have to see. Now, 
one way or another, this lander is going to get to the station. The question is whether the station is going to have to refuel the lander at all once it gets there. I've made a new part, but it wasn't... Um, it's sort of a derivative of another part, so that's why I'm probably not going to make any... Well, I'm definitely not going to make any um, Blender video on it. And it is the ED5. It's a new engine, but it's more or less a scaled-down version of the ED4, the ones that are currently at the bottom of this. It's a gas generator methane oxygen engine, but it's only 48 kilonewtons, and it comes in pairs. It's sort of like a Super Draco pack, but methane and oxygen burning. And the purpose of it is so that we can uh, decelerate quickly at Mars. The problem with our main ED-1 engines that are at the bottom of our lander is that they don't provide that much thrust. They're 30 kilonewtons apiece and we have two of them on the lander. So uh, I felt that it would be better to have something supplementary so that we can do a uh, quicker suicide burn or if we need to decelerate in order to have the parachutes come out, stuff like that. So, so yeah, that is why I have the ED-5. might be that the ED-5 packs aren't necessary, but uh, once we get the fairing off, I'll show you where the ED-5s are. The thing is, a uh, fully fueled lander is pretty hefty. And the two ED-1s, they can, they beat out Mars gravity, of course. They can lift off the lander under Mars gravity, but that's not good for decelerating when you're going really fast into the ground. So it's sort of a two different situations. So I designed the lander engines with the intent of having them lift off, but that's not great for deceleration. So that's the situation. I felt like we needed some supplementary deceleration. And then of course the lander will get rid of these ED5 packs on the surface before returning to orbit. That, that does diminish its reusability. So I'll have to come up with some other solution. Well, the other solution is ISRU. Um, if the lander is only partly fueled when it lands, it doesn't need these booster packs, the ED5 packs. If it's only partly fueled, then the ED1 engines are sufficient to decelerate it. Uh, it's only because initially we'll be landing them, landing the landers fully fueled, because we can't rely on ISRU yet that we need to have this provision. Okay, core ignition. And booster set. So the little booster packs are the this ED5 here. And it's, again, more or less a scaled down ED4. There are some differences like the gas generator exhaust is no longer being pumped directly back into the nozzle instead it's just got a separate gas generator exhaust and um, a few other quirks uh, oh its nozzle is longer because um, it, instead of having you know a surface nozzle and then an extendable vacuum nozzle it just has a uh, vacuum nozzle but not as long a vacuum nozzle as the ED4 vacuum and uh, it's arrayed in a pair and comes with uh, some tankage inside the module, the ED5 pack module. But in any case it was uh, just a quick thing that's basically a pair of those ED4 engines scaled down with a box around it, <laughs> more or less. Okay, fairing set. So here's the lander. The cabin is exactly the same as the Lynx cabin. It's, it, is, it says Lynx spacecraft and it means it. Got a docking port up there, drogue chutes, uh, Kevlar, and then of course we need antennae because this is going to be uh, remote controlled. As we go down here. Alright, so this is an ED5 pack. You can see the two little engine nozzles there. It's exactly like a Super Draco and provides more or less the same function. I might consider even using it as a launch escape system in place of the tower we have right now. We'll see. Uh, we have some solar panels. 
hopefully there'll be enough. I'm not 100% sure about that. The, there are still the ED1 engines at the bottom of this lander. And currently this is fully fueled. So, uh, and that's as designed in my rocket science series. And this has a little bit of fuel based on the size of its tankage, obviously much smaller than this amount. And then we have an inflatable heat shield. I couldn't use a regular heat shield because it wouldn't fit in the fairing. Uh, so we had to use an inflatable heat shield, but this is non-RO. So the question is whether it's still okay. I don't know. We're gonna test it out. We'll see whether it's okay. I had to add tweak skill to the ladder, and I tested on the launch pad to make sure this worked properly, but uh, the ladder was... I didn't have a ladder that was long enough otherwise. But I didn't want to make my own, so... Um, I just add tweak scale to one of the one of the stock ladders. Uh, yeah, we're probably gonna have to use some of the lander's own fuel in order to get there. And since the ED1 engines are blocked by the by the inflatable heat shield, we'll have to use the ED5 packs. The ED5s are not as efficient as the ED1s. The ED1s get 360 seconds high speed. The ED5s only get 337 max and let's do it in vacuum and it's a gas generator en engine with 1200 psi so that's why they're smaller and still get significant thrust again each nozzle there each combustion chamber gets 48 kilonewtons compared to just 30 for the ED1 but the ED1 is pressure fed and only has a chamber at 150 psi so that's why it's so much bigger the chamber pressure basically determines the scale of the engine Okay, separation ignition and nozzle extension. Verify, yep. Enable crossfeed. Let me just go ahead and extend the antennae. And the solar panels. Whether this amount of solar panel re is enough once we get Kerbals on is a good question. It might be enough for just the remote control aspect of it, or maybe not, uh, but Kerbals have their own life support requirements as far as electric charge is concerned, and maybe that will cost more, so we'll need bigger solar panels in that case. Incidentally, right now, the Delta V uh, being read here, the 3559 for the lander, uh, is with the ED5s. It's uh, something more like 4,200 with the ED1s. It's a big difference. Uh, with the ED1s when we dump the ED5s, I should say. We'll go this way. So the ISRU unit doesn't need, you know, as much, well, it doesn't need the ED5s and all. And that's because it's going to be partly fueled only. It's going to only have enough fuel to land. It's not going to have enough fuel to also ascend again, obviously, because it doesn't need to do that. So, yeah, in that case, you know, first of all, it'll be easy to fling to Mars just with a Sagita Super Heavy. And second of all, it doesn't need the ED5 packs. The parachutes probably do a better job overall. The downside is it's and it's got a lot of equipment, not just the ISRU recycler, ore tanks, drills, and uh, supplementary power. So um, a lot of business there. Oh, I didn't put shielding on here. I got to remember that. Hmm. Probably don't need half shield. Uh, they don't, they shouldn't be spending too much time in the lander. But uh, yeah, we'll have to see. The thing is, uh, if it's attached to the Mars transfer vehicle, I think the Mars transfer vehicle... Have, oh, shoot, it didn't turn quickly enough. Okay, quickly, quickly. We're not doing a good job here. The Mars transfer vehicle might not have enough shielding once it averages everything out if we have stuff like this without shielding. And we know we've, we're living on the edge as far as the radiation is concerned there. There's a whole other matter of surface bases. On our first trip, maybe we will have a colony, well, we'll establish a base on Phobos or something with full shielding and have them stay there instead of on the surface of Mars. That might be a better idea.
I remember that the second Mars transfer vehicle heads out before the first one gets back, so just for safety's sake, maybe a Phobos mission for that one, then just a couple of Kerbals, or well, even if we have a crew of four, if we don't have to worry about landing on Mars just yet, and instead just go for Phobos, that might be a little bit easier. With USI colonization, the base modules aren't a whole lot heavier than this, and of course, base modules don't have to carry fuel for ascent. They just need a little bit of decent fuel. In fact, just uh, four of these ED5 packs might be enough to land a base module, as long as it has the parachutes as well. Of course, the recharge rate will be half once we get over to Mars. Oh, Mars transfer vehicle. Battery's getting low even though that should not be possible. Let's switch to it and make sure it's all right. I time warped with it for a hundred days and it never diminished below 90% of its batteries. So, I mean, after all, it's so clear from the Earth's shadow that there's no reason for it to lose much battery power. I'll, I still have to get ship manifest in here. Got to remember that. If nothing else, just uh, purge the waste. Skylab had a mini airlock to get rid of their waste. Well, um, not all of it. Some of it the doctors wanted back home, but uh, in general. <laughs> uh, actually, on Skylab, they didn't actually just eject it out into space. The thing is, in Skylab, they lived in the hydrogen tank of the S4B. So... What the airlock was, was a little thing, it was just a tiny little airlock um, that would eject the waste into the oxygen tank of the S4B. The oxygen tank was their waste tank. Um, that way they didn't leave so much, you know, they, they, we wouldn't have a lot of space debris of their, you know, left behinds. And all of it came down all at once when Skylab uh, deorbited. But you know, on an interplanetary trip, there's not that much concern about space junk. The universe seems to leave a whole lot more space junk than we would ever create. The thing about uh, using a little airlock to get rid of your waste is that you have to remember that stuff tends to expand when, you know, the external pressure is released. So... What happened on Skylab a lot of the time was that they clogged up the little airlock. The stuff wouldn't shoot out. <laughs> it, it gets stuck in there. Okay, looks like we've got a good one kilometer close approach distance. Let us proceed. I could have made the E5s more efficient, of course, by giving them longer nozzles. They only have a nozzle ratio of 40 right now. If I made it 100, of course, they'd be much more efficient, but bigger, right? Which would defeat the purpose. So, they are what they are. 337 as far as their ISP. We don't have to solve the water recycler problem until, like, the next Mars transfer vehicle, because we're not sending Kerbals on this one. So that it does give us some flexibility as far as figuring out how to solve it. And next. Oop. Why is it paused? Why is it paused? Please tell me everything's okay. May is preparing an explosion. Uh, no, it's just. Oh, right. We were entering render range, that's why. Good, good, that makes sense. So, we're not slowing down quickly enough. There it goes. So again, these are 96 kN apiece, each nozzle 48. Not quite the best timing. Uh, it'll be alright, I'm sure. Oh, it's out of render range again, so now we've got good frame rates. These engines do have a tiny bit of gambling, but not a whole lot. Okay, well that get us back into render range. We'll do that first. 
Only a limited amount of ignitions, though. So we don't want to, uh, they only have 10 ignitions a piece. So we don't want to exhaust those right now. If we can do this with RCS instead, that'd be good. Okay, we are approaching to dock. Uh, our shadow is on the solar panels. They're really only necessary around Mars. But in that case, we better have them out before we undock, though. Well, then again, well, yes, because we don't have any crew. Okay, we have docked. All right, well, uh, let's bring some Kerbals back home, I think. <laughs> They're looking a bit uncomfortable there, after all. So, uh, transfer crew. Is it transferring Jeb or not? I don't know. It won't let me do transfer crew again. It's already on the transfer crew dialogue, apparently. Let me escape. Okay, all right. I think just for crew transfers, I should dump in ship manifest now, because it's because the crew module is surrounded by the shell. It's really hard to shift crew into it like this. So, yep, yeah, let me sneak ship manifest in here and I'll be right back. Okay, ship manifest is in and I've transferred the Kerbals over and let's just make sure they're in here and then we'll just bring it down. I don't think I'll transfer any of its resources into the ship, the, the Mars transfer vehicle. It only shows Jeb here. <laughs> transfer crew, well it says all of them there. Um, made as because ship manifest hasn't been updated since 1.4.1. I mean, visually they all seem to be in the links. So I'm gonna go with that, even though KIS does not seem to understand they're all in the links. Well, we'll have to file that away for future reference as far as potential issues may be concerned. But for now, undock. Again, it takes 1,400 to deorbit from this altitude, so not trivial. Well, that seems clear, right? Right? Let's target the ship just in case. If that close approach distance gets too close, we'll have to watch out. Okay, looks good. Just gonna take about 10, maybe eight to ten minutes to actually deorbit so physical time warp more radiation what does that bring them up to eight percent and seven percent okay dumping the service module make sure we have all the stuff we need up here, there's methane and oxygen and everything. Looks fine. All right. Separation. Separation. Yep, that's the that's the service module that's out of electric charge. So that's nominal. Descent mode on. This is a pretty high orbit, so probably ought to use descent mode. Alright, we'll need to roll 180. If it can, <laughs> it's not doing a very good job of rolling 180. Okay, hold on. Uh, I might have been a little bit late on that, let's see. I really don't want to go up again. It doesn't have a whole lot of electric charge to work with. Yeah, we're gonna go back out again. Um, I'll see electric charge two. I guess we'll be all right going around once. Okay, well, going around. And electric charge is fine this time. There's Australia. Oh, maybe I can do one more thing in this episode. We can send some fuel up to our mission. 
to the Mars transfer vehicle. We need to re replenish the xenon gas we failed on the two attempts previously. I can I fix that stuff so we can send that fuel up finally. I guess I still had pitch on on Smart ASS last time. That's why I couldn't do the roll properly. It still wants to hold pitch even though I haven't told it to do so. Okay. Uh, forward shield release eventually, hopefully. It'll be fine. Uh, let me... Oh, I'll need to arm those. Arm. Arm. They'll, they'll probably pop up even with the this thing rattling around. Not the ideal situation, but this wasn't the right docking port is the problem. Okay, splash down confirmed and recover. 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 Okay, here we go with a xenon gas launch. I'll control it manually. And we're using a super duper heavy. I'm not calling it an ultra heavy. We'll reserve that for later, but uh, yeah, super duper heavy is funnier. Uh, yeah, definitely funnier. So, yeah, uh, we're basically using a tug instead of one of the service modules. So that that's what's lightening things up and making it a little bit easier. And of course, this time we uh, hopefully won't have any decoupling issues. So with that, ignition. And launch. Oh, why are you rolling? And is the core open? I mean, on? No, the core is not on. Uh, wait. Yeah, the core is not on. Good. I don't know why it's rolling, though. That's suspicious, isn't it? Okay, core ignition. And booster separation. Off they go. Bearing separation. Okay, so there's our tug holding the xenon tank. The small xenon tank, of course. The tug's fuel is locked right now, of course. Okay, separation. And nozzle extension. That checks out. And enable cross feed for the RCS. That fuel remains locked. And we we're in a nice close orbit this time. The tug is just going to go on battery power out there. I don't know if it's going to be able to deorbit itself. Probably not. We'll see. I mean, it's going to have, you know, some delta V left over and it'll be much lighter without the xenon gas. Of course, it'll carry the xenon tank away. We'll see. Yeah, okay, it's too finicky right now anyway. So, here we go. Okay, let's just ignite. Okay, we've still got a little bit of fuel in this stage, so I'll, I guess I'll hang on to it for the time being. Okay, I don't actually know how long it's going to take to use the tug's fuel. Okay, ignition. Do this bit first. All right, separation. And we want to control from this now. And unlock the fuels. And 1,700 is enough, so we're good. I still get the feeling that, well, maybe the margin between the super heavy and the super duper heavy, probably not that much. Maybe it's possible to use just a super heavy for this. 
I've kept the docking port spare instead of having them all over the place. There is only one here. Uh, the tank isn't docked to the tug technically. It's just integrated into the tug. Oh, it's going to take too long. Oops. I should have started already. Well, we'll dock directly at the propellant end. No point going all the way over to the front end. Uh, I see a docking port right there. Okay, approaching to dock. We look to have a um, decent amount of methane and oxygen left. We'll see if it's enough to deorbit it. Of course, we still left the upper stage of the Sagitta in a high orbit. At some point, maybe we should do sort of a wet w workshop thing and collect them all and string them together. After all, we are using converted Sagitta upper stages as modules anyway. It would be nice to have a way of converting those. Xenon refueler... Electric charge... what was it? Say? Oh, no, that is the... it's talking about the upper stage. Right. I gave the tugs 14 days worth of power. I do a lot of stuff around 14 days. You know, the Lynx spacecraft is 14 days of supplies and all that. Because that's the standard sort of moon mission thing. So again, this xenon gas tank is half of one of those that are actually on the vessel. In terms of volume. In terms of diameter, it's 4 meters compared to 5 meters, so only a little bit less in diameter, but makes a big difference. Okay, connection. Let's transfer the stuff. Okay, and tug release. If it's willing. <laughs> Zoom in. Undock. Oh, oh shoot. Uh, that's not the side I wanted. Okay. It's turning arbitrarily. Okay, we do have enough to deorbit. So, good times. Maybe we'll just stick to using the super duper heavy then. Just so that we can deorbit this. It'll definitely not have enough to deorbit if we use just the super heavy. Okay, now it's a uh, safe enough direction to burn in. Departing. Okay, that's good enough for a fiery demise. And with this on its way to meet its doom, I think I'll sign off. So with this, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.